Hello, everyone. Welcome once again to The New Now. I'm delighted to have Dylan Charles on with us for the first time, editor of Waking Times, co-founder of Said Same Website. I highly recommend if you haven't to check it out. And he is working his way into what I could say is maybe a new vocation, self-mastery coach, which leads (laughs) us into our talk today or where we're going to begin, Icky Guy, uh, Finding Life's Purpose, Discovering Life's Purpose. Hello, Dylan. Hey, Lorenzo. Thanks for having me on here. You said some very kind things before we started, and I really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, it's an honor to be here. Yeah, you were one of my first inspirations. Uh, you know, we did print for 11, 12 years, the, the new Agora. And, you know, we shared, yeah, okay. yeah, we shared tons of what you were sharing. And, you know, from Gary Z. McSee uh, to Kingsley L. Dennis and a whole bunch of others. So you were yeah. pretty much one of the only publishers directly in line and online with the evolutionary bent of what we wish to share. You know, as far as giving people an opportunity to become better people through their own actions, which is what led me to Iki Guy, figuring you got to do it for yourself. You have to determine it for yourself. And uh, but I don't want to put any words in another editor's mouth. How would you mm-hmm. see Iki Guy and how it's led you to where you are today? Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to back up just a bit. I'd like to get into Iki Guy, Iki Guy but um, you had um, mentioned that you know my work at Waking Times was an inspiration to what you guys have done at the New Agora, and mm-hmm. I really appreciate you saying that. And I just wanted to comment on something. I've noticed uh, just over the last few years uh, some deep shifts in my own personality, my own my own just the levels of consciousness, my own awareness. And there's also been simultaneously some tremendous shifts in in society and culture and the way that people uh, relate to news and relate to information. Um, it seems like over the last couple of years since COVID, a lot of people who weren't paying attention before are paying attention now. Um, but it also seems that Whereas prior to COVID, there was a lot of information regarding personal evolution, personal transformation, transformation. A lot of this dovetailed and fit nicely in with the alternative narratives about what freedom really means. You know, where does freedom really come from? Who's really safeguarding your freedom and who is not? Who is, uh, you know, perhaps covertly trying to um, assault your freedom in various ways. And so I've noticed a, a big split from those two ideas. And now it seems to me like people are mainly, if they're if they're curious about what's really going on in the world, that's what they're curious about. And they're soaking up facts. They're soaking up information. They're getting into detailed, detailed details. They're coming up with theories and ideas, and they're really focusing on what's happening externally. But at the same mm-hmm. time, I sense there's perhaps less of an interest or less of a, of a connection between that information and the importance of personal development. And so um, kind of in light of that, kind of just honoring what I've been feeling over the last couple of years, I've backed off from doing publishing at Waking Times, especially over this year. And I'm just really trying to like develop um, the resources within myself to approach it differently. And so it's interesting that you bring up Ikigai because that really is what I think is what's most valuable to people right now. Um, is it valuable for people to look at the COVID scene, to look at the the you know the things going on with the world, world the wars in Ukraine, Israel, and and these places? Is it really valuable for them to look at you know what's happening in terms of the economy? You know how much does this really help and improve their lives? And so, Ika guy from from my experience when I've used it um, in coaching, and also like I've, I've received some instruction on it from other coaches that have been very instrumental in my own journey. It's just kind of a framework. It's it's a really just kind of a way to help you uh, zero in on your purpose and to help you understand that your purpose isn't one thing necessarily. It's really sort of a com- combination. It's an amalgam of a few very important things. Um, you know, how can you make money? What does the world need? What do you love to do? What are you really good at? What are you skilled at? Right. So you know, find those points where those four uh, ideas vector, and you kind of have an idea of what you can do to sustain your sustain yourself financially, economically, but in a way that also gives you a sense of meaning. You wake up in the morning, you're excited about what you do, you enjoy your life, and you're living in a higher energy that way and are able to actually contribute to change in the world by just basically rubbing off on people everywhere you go, just being an awesome, energized, highly conscious person. And so um, I know that a lot of people are really feeling a, a sense of lack of purpose these days. And so, Mm. you know, in that regard, uh, you know, begin perhaps beginning with a concept like Ikigai can be very helpful in in just saying, okay, wait a minute, how am I thinking about this? Like, what is my, what is my process in 
coming to find my purpose? Is it mm -hmm. one of just struggle and suffering? Am I just trying to suffer my way until I figure out something new, you know? And when people say they're stuck and without purpose, a lot of times that's what they do is they kind of just stay in the same level of energy, the same mm -hmm. vibration, you know, their, their head's filled with negative thoughts, uh, their body's filled with negative energy. And so they're just kind of waiting for something to change. And mm -hmm. perhaps by starting with Ikigai can give you a sense that waiting for something to change isn't going to change anything. It's up to it's up to you, the individual, mm -hmm. to say, okay, which direction does my life need to go? Which direction do I want my life to go? Which direction do I feel confident, comfortable, and capable of taking my life in? And then going from there. Um, I'll say one last thing on that. You know, the people that I speak to who uh, talk about having a lack of purpose, uh, lack of, uh, you know, just intention in their life, what I find, Lorenzo, is that if you really... If you really get into a deep conversation with some of these people, you'll find out that they really know what their purpose is. Mm. They just have a very difficult time speaking it out loud to themselves, maybe even in their own mind, but also speaking a lot out loud into the world because they're so many of us are living with that story of we're not good enough, uh, we're not mm. capable, we don't deserve uh, what we want. And so, if you can, if you can get in there and help people to to just speak about themselves in their life in a different way, you'll find that they know really what they want to be doing, but they just don't have confidence that it's possible or possible for them. And they probably see other people doing the exact same thing and think, well, that person can do it because of this reason. He's famous. He's had, you know, opportunities, legs up, lucky, whatever it is. But people don't realize that, that they're probably already sitting on their purpose. They probably already know mm. what it is. Well, how would you begin to suggest to someone, because, because I agree with you fully, they get from there to here or here to there if they're looking at you now and going you know sure dylan you've done the work and you've met a whole bunch of interesting people and you have the time to work on yourself you know i've heard all of this but i've got four kids three mortgages and and a dog to look after uh you know how <laughs> you know how <laughs> you know how well, do I mean, I, yeah how do i make that connection or begin to make that connection well, it's just funny because uh, I'm I'm close. I'm right there in the pocket with you. I've got three kids and two dogs and a mortgage. So, I mean, you know, and and really, like, I mean, the truth of life is that it would be nice. It would be really, really nice. And 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 in some way, I believe that a lot of people are striving for this. Uh, but it would really, really be nice if we could somehow just say, "Hey, there's no pressure on us for a period of time: mm. year, five years, ten years, whatever. There's no economic pressure. There's no worldly pressures of responsibilities, this and that. So we just have time to figure it out. Just, just go figure it out. You know, here's okay. the here's a bank account. You know, here's mm. a passport. Whatever you need to do, just go figure it out. Figure out what your purpose is. Most of us don't live in that. If you want to live, if you want to experience that kind of uh, situation, those circumstances, you have to create that. You have to create that for yourself somehow. And so. You know, for somebody who is, for a lot of the people that I work with as a as a coach, like a lot of my clients, they do find themselves in that situation. You know, life has already happened. They're already in the middle of their life. Things are already set up a certain way. There's already routines. There's already responsibilities. Mm -hmm. There's already bills. There's maybe debt. Uh, there's already there's already downward uh, pressure. There's already stress. And so the reality is that like you kind of have to figure this stuff out as you're going along. You kind of have to work on yourself on a daily basis, no matter what the heck else is going on in your life. And, you know, I use my life in my work, uh, in, in, in my podcast and my writing and the work I do with my, my clients. I use my life experiences as, as a guide. I'm very open with them. And so even like over the last couple of, couple of years, Lorenzo, like the anxiety level in my own body has somewhere out of nowhere, just come from out of nowhere and just, just elevated to levels I've never experienced before. And I see this in a lot of people. I think I don't know what the connection is to COVID, additional stress in the world, whatever it is. But uh, I don't have time. I don't have time to just check out and go spend a month in the jungle. <laughs> like, I, you know, I, there was a time in my life where I did have a little bit of freedom to do some of those things, but I have to figure it out. I have to, I have to be able to, you know, I can't, I can't just say, okay, well, I'm off. I'm not sure of myself. I'm out, off my purpose. Well, I'm going to go spend a week, two weeks, three weeks doing a retreat, go drink some plant medicines, go sit with some shamans or this sort of things and figure, figure things out. And that's not really, uh, it's, it's not possible for most people, but it's not even really uh, that helpful because if you go out and you, you leave your environment and you totally reset and you come back to your environment, you're still faced with your environment. You still have to learn to adapt to your environment. You're still in that same fishbowl, if you will. So the real like 
the real benchmark is how do you feel on an everyday basis? How do you feel about your life every single day, throughout the day, different times of day? And when you can master the fluctuations in the own in your own feelings about your life and about how you view the world and the possibilities for yourself in it, that's really where the, where the gold is. Personal growth is a daily, a daily process. And you have to be able to say, okay, um, I know where I was a month ago. I know where I was six months ago. I know where I was a year ago. Things are getting better. I know that I can see a greater vision for myself still. I still feel there's greater possibilities to be at peace, to be uh, more productive, uh, to be just um, uh, more positive in general, to, 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 to clear up my thoughts. But I'm not there yet. But I'm 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 on my path. I'm moving forward, and so one of the things I really uh, really focus a lot on in my coaching is is helping people to understand that there's a specific skill required for all of us evolutionary individuals, all of us who are concerned with experiencing and living in you know what we may call higher consciousness during this lifetime. Um, yeah, I can go to a shaman's retreat and experience that for a night. But how can I experience that on a day-to-day -day basis? And so I work with people in really understanding that there's a, a skill, the skill of letting go, the skill of self-mastery of your emotions, the uh, with the goal of emotional sobriety in mind so that you can stay and operate in a relaxed body with peace of mind. And then you have the energy. Uh, it's, the energy is not being uh, spent on negative thinking. It's not being spent on worry, anxiety, stress. Fear, but then you have the 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 energy free to actually use your time to move things forward for yourself. Um, people who are in in marriages and and you know like in, in family uh, parental roles and that sort of thing uh, with financial obligations and all that stuff, they don't have a lot of time. And so the time mm -hmm. that they do have, they have to be able to have mastery over that time and. I don't think there's anybody here listening to this who would disagree that it's really difficult to concentrate on what's best for you when all you feel is anxiety, when all you feel is overwhelm, mm. when all you feel is a sense of fear about the world and a sense of doubt. And so really like the the change happens when, when the change happens when people develop the courage to be exceptionally truthful with themselves about who they are, what they want, how they got here, what their options are. What feelings are taking them further away from that and what they can do to master their own inner world so they can have the energy to go out and experience the life that they know they deserve. How would you say people could develop that honesty? I would think developing. Uh, yeah, because I would think a lot of people, as you say, do know what's best for them, do know where they want to go, you know, have that. And I probably always had that since they've been three or four. Yeah, that's just my opinion. And uh, people end up lying to themselves quite a bit throughout mm -hmm. their lives for all the reasons you mentioned, family, money, children, mm -hmm. uh, you know, responsibilities and, and such. So how do they make that connection where they're going, sure, you know, you've done it, you know, you've, mm -hmm. uh, you've, you know, I, I think it's great that you're in, a, in the same boat in a similar way. You have children, you have a mortgage, you're a regular person, you have anxieties. I mean, that is, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that in my opinion yeah. is, is something I share with everyone is like, I'm nobody special, you know, you, you know, anyone <laughs> is everyone. And we've all had to get over our challenges and develop that honesty or self-honesty. Well, honesty is about communication. And, and let's say like, if I wanted to master free throws, right? If I wanted to get good at basketball free throws, like, where would I go do that? I would go to a basketball court. I would stand at the free throw line. I would shoot free throws all day long, right? Uh, uh, honesty is about communication. So a great place to start is, um, you know, rather than a basketball court, get a journal. Hmm. Write to yourself, speak to yourself. And it's I always recommend journaling with my clients. And a lot of, some people do it, but a lot of people don't do it. A lot of people just don't understand like there is a very real scientific almost value to to journaling something happens when you move a thought or an idea from yeah bingo <laughs> my, yeah. my latest journal yeah yeah something something happens when you move a thought physically outside of your head down the meridians mm. energy channels of your hand out through your you know your key hand your writing hand and onto paper and then you articulate it you see it the energy of the thought literally moves from your body to outside of your body but it exists and then when you see it you're actually able to <coughs> memorize and things coalesce in a different way so journaling is actually very very therapeutic and it doesn't cost anything right um if people can learn to talk to themselves i think you'll find that if 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 you develop a journaling practice 
uh, it's very, it's very difficult to BS yourself when it's just you, you know, the truth, you know, the truth, right? Uh, but another place where they could do that is, uh, a confidant, a coach, a counselor, a therapist, like these people, you know, and I've, I've leaned on all of these, uh, you know, I've had counselors, therapists, uh, I've got coaches in my life. I've got great friends that I can call any hour of the day to just be like, Hey, this is how I'm feeling. Suss this out with me. Um, but find people in your life, life that are willing to be honest. That are willing to be honest, willing to call you out on your BS. You know, I had a I had a conversation with a young client who's uh, currently in Iceland, and uh, and it was just an interesting call. A young man, and he's a stellar young man. I really have a lot of admiration for him, and he's just kind of stuck. And over the last couple of months or six months or so, we've been kind of communicating back and forth, and I've noticed in his behavior towards me that there's a lack of commitment to himself. Right? He'll make mm. a promise to me, which is really a promise to himself. And then he breaks it. And then he's got reasons for that. And then he's very mm. adamant about articulating the reasons because the mm. reasons make sense. They, you know, <laughs> and so we got on this call and I was like, Hey man, I got you for a few, few short minutes. Everything that you're telling me is just excuses. It's just excuses, mm. right? Mm. It, it's, it's BS, right? I don't, you know, it doesn't matter. I personally don't care what the excuses are. I just want to see you happy. I want to see you have results. And from my standpoint and my position in your life, I could tell you like the way that you're going about looking at your life isn't truthful. It isn't honest. You're not being honest with yourself. And it was a very profound conversation and had a very big impact on this, this young man. And so as, as a coach, sometimes Lorenzo, I find myself in that position of like, this person needs a reality check. Mm. And I know, I know I've worked with coaches that are unable to, to provide that reality check. You know, they're concerned about offending someone. They're concerned about someone taking things personally. And to be honest, a lot of people take things personally, and that's a sign of, of an, of a need for greater personal development, right? You shouldn't have to take things personally, 100%, yeah. but find somebody that's find somebody in your life. That's willing to risk. You should get really willing to risk being absolutely truthful and honest to you. And I think you'll find that, I think people will find that that is uh, that mirror, a proper mirror, a soundboard for that stuff is very beneficial. Well, what do you think brings people to that? Like, obviously this fellow probably contacted you. Obviously he's mm -hmm. invested some uh, currency, you know, in the process. Mm -hmm. Obviously there was a, a moment when he said, man, I need this guy's help. I want to change, you know, I want to get from A to B and I can't do it myself. So, because he's made that action. And then in the middle of the process, as you said, all of these like I like to call them the big butts, these big butts show up in his face, yeah, yeah, right, you right. know, excuses or blames, as you say. And what do you think brings those up for people? And besides, you know, a punch in the nose from reality, which a lot of people I find need to wait for, you know, before they get over the, their excuses, uh, can bring that about for them. Like how would a coach help that and how would they help themselves to get there? Well, kind of, I kind of feel like the, the society itself, the culture that we're in doesn't really uh, it may value, but it doesn't really like demonstrate that it values honesty or integrity. Mm. Okay. Um, a lot of people make a lot of excuses. A lot of people get away with a lot of excuses. It's just how people roll. It's just how people roll. And so uh, people aren't really used to having somebody tell them, Hey, wait, full stop. I'm calling you out on that. That's not true. And you know, it's not true. Mm. Um, but you know, you know, generally speaking, like people don't realize that, that there's a, there's a quality in our culture of, of a, you might call it like there's a, a quality of pathological lying in our culture. Just lie, 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 you know, right. It's, people, people pick that up. I mean, people lie all the time and they don't even realize they're doing it. Most importantly, they lie to themselves, right? Yeah. I'm going to go to the gym this Tuesday and they don't go. Yeah. I'm going to stop eating sugar for a week and they don't do it. Yeah. I'm going to, you know, I need to quit drinking, whatever. Okay. Well, I could drink it next week and well, after the new year's party, whatever, you know, and these are, these are, you know, qualities of a pathological liar it's a sort of a, a almost a, one of the one of the other mind viruses in our in our culture so mm -hmm. people are really just used to avoiding those hard questions and avoiding the truth uh, uh, which is a way of avoiding responsibility and so when i really look at this when i really go deep uh, with someone on this we look at the the emotional vibration like the 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 feeling mm -hmm. of dissatisfaction the feeling of dis ease mm. within them we look at that as a substance of its own almost like as a, as, as a drug its own addictive 
substance, right? So this set of feelings, this 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 set of neurochemical cocktails that are given off. You know, we have serotonin, dopamine, we have uh, um, adrenaline, cortisol. We have all these different hormones that produce uh, oxytocin, the happiness uh, hormone, right? We have all these hormones that produce different feelings in the body. And we tend to only give ourselves credit and think that we're addicted to the ones that feel good. But I think mm. that that's not true. We're actually chemically addicted to the negative ones as well. So we get really used to experiencing negative states and we subconsciously create circumstances or create events or chaos or drama within our relationships that give us access to that drug, that set of negative feelings. And so as a coach, like helping people to see this really kind of is often enough the breakthrough that they need. They're like, well, wait a minute, hold on. You're right. I keep finding myself back at the same set of feelings. Well, what did you have to do to get there? If you were addicted on crack and you said you found yourself another hit of crack. And I said, well, what did you have to do to find some crack? Well, I had to go down the block. I had to rob a liquor store, whatever it is. Like, you know, the process of what you had to do to get your crack, 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 people who are addicted to crack and hard drugs, the drugs don't even feel good anymore. No. But when you look at it like that, you can see the process, the hard work, like the diligence, the effort, the commitment they will put into recreating that feeling for themselves. And you could say that a drug addict is doing that unconsciously as well. Like they don't know what's driving them. They're just driven, driven, driven. Something else is in control. And so it's the same way with these negative feelings, this anxiety, this fear, this overwhelm, this self-doubt. Like what are the, you were feeling good for a couple of days. What are the events that happened that transpired to where now you're feeling that same familiar set of feelings again? And then it's usually, oh, well, I... I started a conflict with someone at work. I was rude to somebody. I road raged on somebody. I was, uh, um, you know, I, I binge ate Oreo cookies at nighttime. <laughs> right? Like I, I started a fight with my wife over nothing. Right. Um, I got crazy drunk at the party and made a fool of myself. Like there's always all these things going on. And the end result is access to that set of feelings that isn't pleasurable, but it serves as another drug. And so I really focus on helping people clear out the things of their life, which, which prevent them from seeing that mechanism within themselves for what it really is. Um, they may be drinking, they may be smoking, they may be smoking pot or doing whatever drugs or pills or whatever to, to sedate themselves. But when you take all of that stuff out of the way, you finally get a chance to see uh, the, un the emotional patterns that are, that are driving all of this. And that's what people really need to pay attention to. And in the context of the world that we're in, if you just look at like the, the tone and tenor of media, the tone and tenor of, <laughs> of news, the tone and tenor of political debate, the tone and tenor of uh, how leadership talks to people, oh. um, it's it's very much it's it's very much um, uh, it's conflict oriented, it's drama oriented, um, it's it's none of it is geared to create um, sound intellectual reason thought. It's all geared to appeal to the emotional facets of the brain. It's all geared to appeal to the emotional side of the body. And so people have to really realize that in large and mass, like we're addicted to sets of emotions more than we are anything else. And this, you can call it this, this aspect of how the mind and, and body works is being uh, almost in a way weaponized against us to basically make us turn all of our energy over to the fluctuations of whatever we're feeling at that moment versus having a semblance of rational, logical control over what the emotional body is doing. So we could keep moving forward no matter which way the wind is blowing around us, you know? Well, how would you put that in the context of, let's say the mind virus, I'm happy you brought that up. So the mind virus, <laughs> you know, connected to the emotional pain body connected to the addition, uh, well, addiction to, to said feelings, as, as you just mentioned, and the uh, media, cell phones, even you know, mm -hmm. laptop news, doing that on purpose, right? So on purpose, on pain. How would you allow people to? Um, well, how would you suggest people, you know, start to get a grip on that for themselves? Yeah, there's an old phrase I've heard so many times, but it, it goes like this: It says, "Awareness is curative." Okay. Awareness is curative. That's, that's, that's medicine in and of itself. Right. So, and, and you see this man, cause you've been involved in what we've been calling the awakening. You can see the dramatic shifts that people can uh, uh, take on in their lives in a very short time. Once they're aware of mm. 
you know, once they're aware that circumstances that they were living under aren't necessarily what they perhaps thought they were <laughs> living under, you know, the world, the world isn't what it really seems. And mm. you see people change and adapt to that very, very quickly. Um, and so we know that people are, you know, human beings more than anything else are good at adapting, <laughs> adapting, adapting, That's adapting. True. And so a lot of times, like just enlightening people with knowledge about how the the nervous system works right how the the mind body connection works you know just and in, in how you know the brain is understood to function you know there's you know one of the it's not a recent model and it's it's kind of slowly getting upended here but this model of the triune brain there's three parts of the brain there's the reptilian part of the brain you know down in the in the cortex and the base of the brain and then there's the the mammalian or the um the uh, mammal brain, what is it? The emotional brain, right? Sort of like the mid-center brain. And then there's the human brain, like the, the the logical, rational mind. And so we know that like the immune system, or sorry, the nervous system has a tremendous impact on which area of the brain is really, um, you know, calling the shots in any moment. And we all know this to be true because everybody's been scared. Everybody's like, you know, been around a loud thunderclap or a tornado, or they've been out in the woods and they see a bear, or they, maybe they've been in a road rage incident. And you know that as soon as that raw primal fear gets into the body and in the nervous system, logic and rationality go out the window. Mm. <laughs> it's like all of that stuff, all of that stuff goes out the window. And so we operate on, you know, in, in what they call fight or flight mode. But just above that is like the the emotional brain. And so when we operate in the emotional brain, like our our needs are different. And so if we're constantly sort of like riding in this state of, of everything's emotionalized, you know, the ways that we communicate on social media, like we communicate with emojis, simple happy faces. Now, I mean, I, I, I keep getting like, you know, anytime I have a service call or a doctor's visit or anything, I keep getting, uh, you know, uh, an email saying, Hey, we want you to rate this. And it's like four different yeah. emojis, right. You know, sad face, super happy face and everything in between. And it's like, you know, that movie Idiocracy, when when they go to the hospital, perhaps you've seen that, you know, it's the same thing. It's a, re a reduction of intellect, a reduction of intelligence, um, uh, a, a bypassing of the rationality of the human mind and, and, and supplanting and, and exchanging that for emotionality. Uh, so, you know, we're screaming, we're, we're fighting, we can't think straight, you know, like everything's hysterical, right? And so, yeah, I mean, we're we're basically like being trained externally to just communicate and operate with the emotional body only. And so mastering the nervous system, mastering the emotions gives you access to the parts of your mind that allow you to think long term, that allow you to think what's best for me today, what's best for me this week, what's best for me over the next 10 years of my life. And so, yeah, it's very, it's very clear to me that everything coming at us is, is demanding an emotional response. And so when people understand that and they start to see that for what it is, they start to say, okay, I know what's going on here. Mm. I want something, I want something good for my life out of here. And this is a roadblock to that. And so they start to look at things differently and they start to start to participate. They can start to change the level of significance that they uh, prescribe to external events. You know, like for example, uh, people that I know on, you know, people that are I'm in communication with on Facebook, right? Um, anything happens, they go crazy, sending all the memes about it. You know, oh, the yeah. latest thing. <laughs> you know, I've got, I've got, I've got plenty of friends from Israel. I've got friends who don't support Israel. <laughs> yeah, I've got all ends of the spectrum. You know, it's all of a sudden everybody comes a, you know, everybody comes a one trick pony and just starts repeating the same information over and over and over again. You can see how, like, you know, if you, if you look at it like a virus, like that's that's the spread of it. Like, you know, these little nodes of repeaters that, like, okay, this is the this is the the missive. This is what the information is. This is what the talking points is. People pick those up and they spread the virus through the way that they communicate. So ultimately, we're talking about communication, and and unfortunately, I think that people communicate with themselves now in this way as well. And mm. so it's one of the things I really, I really constantly work on with myself is how do I communicate with myself? How do I communicate with my partner in my relationship? Like these are the two areas that are most important. They're closest to me in my life. Like how am I communicating? What can I do to upgrade and up level my communication to myself? And it's really not, it's, I can't say that it's at all easy. It's a process. It's a commitment. It's a daily like, okay, I recognize now that I'm I'm not really walking my path, that I'm I'm not really doing myself justice by thinking healthy thoughts or eating healthy foods, you know. And so it's 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 a path. There is no 
there are breakthrough moments along the way in the path, but it's it's a constant attunement to your own your own burning desire to to experience positivity, inner peace, mm. and purpose in this life, no matter what is going on outside of us, no matter what's going on. I like the word desire. I would say that's mm-hmm. a key key aspect in willing to uh, pay the price, whatever that is for you, to get to where you need to go. Um, yeah. You know, how would you connect? Let's say I'm sure you've heard of the recapitulation. You know, one of uh, Carlos Castaneda's way of uh, journaling their entire life, as you say, the recapitulation was is... a way, you know, way of looking over their life. Like, how would you would you, if at all, compare journaling to that, looking over it's your life? Yeah. Fascinating that you brought up Carlos Castaneda. I mean. Um... His book, uh, is it Tales of Sorcery? The first one? Um, I'm not sure. The first, it was just the Yaki Way of Life was the first one. Tales of Power was one of them, though. Tales of Power was the first one, I think. Second I think. or third, but either way, that's a good book. Those books were like the first books that I picked up in my early 20s when I was like suffering through all the contemporary problems you know yeah and and i just happened to come across carlos castaneda i think i read this i think i read tales of power which might be the second book i think i read that first and i was like oh wait a minute hold on there's something really interesting in here you know and so i ended up reading all those books but that's been like 25 plus plus years i don't remember i don't remember him discussing the recapitulation that may have been in some of his later books i think some of the ones where it got kind of weird (laughs) Um, but what I do recall is I do recall, uh, and I've had some profound experiences around this, you know, he talks about that moment of when uh, your death comes and you dance with death, right. And you get a chance to look at your life in that state. And so kind of one of the things that the, you know, Don Juan was doing with Carlos was trying to get him to see this stuff before he was actually dying to actually see mm-hmm. and understand his life in those, in those terms. Um, I have used journaling when I'm inspired, I've used journaling when I'm a wreck. I've used journaling when I'm scared. I've used journaling when I'm sad and I've used journaling in all states. And sometimes I'll go through phases where I don't journal anything. And then something happens. I'm like, Oh wait, I need to connect. I need to, re- I need to reconnect. I need to talk to myself. And so it's a, it's a, it's a matter of inspiration. I think, you know, there's all kinds of different journaling models. There's different people who are, you know, supposed psychological experts on journaling that know exactly which prompts to use and this and that. But what I found in talking to many, many, many people, both in, in helping to facilitate plant medicine ceremonies and then working as a, you know, a, a coach with one-on-one clients is that journaling is so personal. Like people are just going to do it the way that they do it, if they do it at all. And so if it's helpful for someone to sit and write about events of their life in the form of a recapitulation, yeah. You know, when 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 a person signs up with me to do long-term coaching, I really like to work with people, you know, for at least three months and longer if possible, but at least three months. It gives us an opportunity to get to know each other, to really understand the dynamics. And we, you know, we're checking in every week. And so uh, it's a process. So versus saying, hey, here's a call, you're fixed, go out in the world. And I found that, you know, just with my experience, like working with people for that long really gives us a chance to really like find our magic together. Um, but when they sign up and you know, I say, okay, great. Awesome. Super happy to have you work with me. Here's a questionnaire that I'm going to send you, take your time, filling it, filling it out. And when you fill it out, uh, then we'll schedule our first appointment. It's like six or seven pages long of questions. And so sometimes I get these back and people are like, uh, they've written 30 pages, Lorenzo. Like I'll ask a question, you know, that nobody's ever asked them, that they never thought to ask yourself mm-hmm. about things that may have happened in their in their youth, you know, things that may have uh, set in motion a particular emotional patterns and programs, which may be harming them still. Uh, and nobody's ever asked them. They've never put any thought to that. So mm-hmm. one, one, you know, just a normal question on the questionnaire can result in three or four pages of writing. And I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody say, oh my God, this, this questionnaire was super intense. I don't know if I can do it. And I say, Hey, just relax and take your time. There's no pressure. This is all about you and you. And when they finally get it back to me, they're like, oh my God, something happened when I started this. It was very cathartic. Like I just sort of hit a pace. I've never said any of this stuff to anybody. I started crying. I just want to get this stuff out, you know, excellent. And so yeah, yeah. So I mean, in that regard, like like journaling prompts, I guess really, you know, I guess I use them and they're they're helpful to folks. But yeah, like whether it's recapitulation or however you look at it, like when people finally start to get curious about their themselves, right? Mm-hmm. When they finally start to wonder who they are, what they are, what's thinking the thoughts, who's creating the feelings, <laughs> you know, when they really start to get curious about that, like um, there's no there's no 
end to the exploration. Like it is the final frontier. It really is. Really. I mean, you can almost you can go back into any moment of your life and you can you can you can project and imagine any possible potential future for your life and you can work out and relive and 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 imagine and create details for anything. I mean the the, the possibilities for exploring your own your own life are so vast. And you know, these days I really look at like like coaching as like three really fundamental things I think are important uh, with the way that I approach coaching. One is is this uh, tenant one would be to study your life, make your life the focal point of your study. Right, this is where this is beginning the beginning all of your your study time, your learning, your energy beginning here will lead to the greatest financial and personal benefits that you could possibly imagine. Like there's no other, there's no other set of knowledge that you can plug into your mind. That's going to lead to greater, more positive results in your life. The second aspect of that would be to um, align yourself with the spiritual philosophy that works for you. Right. You know, help people to understand like, what is spirituality to you? What does it mean to you? Is it a, is it far out something that you can't touch? Is it something pragmatic with you? Is it a certain feeling that you have? you have is it a set of rituals mm. what is spirituality to you and then the third tenet would be to um master your master your emotional body uh, develop emotional sobriety i mean even in some of the great works of I'm looking for a book i had on my desk earlier today but a book by a taoist master named uh, master hua ching ni the book is called the workbook for the spiritual development of all people and mm. this is these are he's a very prolific profound uh, taoist master from a long long lineage but he's carrying forth this message that has been under development for thousands of years and in this very small book it's important enough for him to write a whole chapter on the idea of emotional independence it's that much of a spiritual uh, it's 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 of that high of spiritual significance, emotional independence, emotional mastery, emotional sobriety. And I use the term sobriety because emotions are the drug that precede craving and dependency on any and all other drugs. And so like the study of your life, like really, if you look at the Witsi philosophy, which is a, a religious, not a religious, but a spiritual tradition from Africa, those are the, those are the, that's the spiritual tradition that uses the plant medicine in Boga as a, as a sacrament. When you sit with proper Witi elders in ceremony, and if you get the opportunity to hear and understand what their uh, purpose is in doing this medicine, their purpose is in, in participating in this spiritual philosophy, it, it has everything. I mean, it's all 100% about studying life, studying your own life. And when we go into ceremonies, we say, all right, tonight it's you versus you. Who's going to win? Right? <laughs> it's you versus you. Who's going to win? Somebody's going to come out on top. Who's it going to be? Mm. And when you when you journey with a, a a plant medicine like a boga, it's it gives you the opportunity to to and it's unlike anything else, but it gives you the opportunity to to very very closely examine um, broad details or very specific details of your life, and you can look at your life in a completely different context. And so, what you end up leaving with, um, you know, after ceremony for that is you end up leaving with an understanding of uh, just a, like a much deeper, richer understanding of why you do what you do, why you did what you did, why what you did that you thought was so bad and horrible that unforgivable that you've been living with guilt and shame, shame with ever since, why that's irrelevant to your life now, why it's okay, why it's, why it's okay to let that go and let go of that, that mm. guilt and shame, right? And so when I look at when I look at spiritual philosophy, I mean, philosophy, I'm really driven by the the traditions of of the Amazon, the, uh, the ayahuasca or the yahi drinkers of the the Amazon, and my teachers uh, from from that culture. And there are many traditions of ayahuasqueros. There are many, um, you know, there's there's a lot of different denominations, if you will, of ayahuasca drinkers, and a lot of them are what they call syncretic. And so, if you go to an ayahuasca church or an ayahuasca ceremony, a lot of times you'll see. Um, well, you'll hear songs in Spanish. Spanish wasn't the original language from the jungle, right? Like the, 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 the medicine came out of the jungle from a very indigenous populations, like deep in the jungle, they didn't have Spanish. So that's a syncretic addition to the tradition singing in Spanish. If the, if the shaman or, 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 or facilitator of the ceremony, uh, you'll find that they often have uh, rosaries or candles with Virgin Marys on them, or uh, sometimes crucifixes or, you know, Christian symbology. Well, that's a syncretic tradition as well, mm. right? So they're, they're attaching spiritual ideas onto something that 
was devoid of all that, something that was pure, that was free of all that in its inception from its from its original core. Right. And so my elders from the Amazon, the Sequoia, like they've always taught me to avoid avoid the worldly things, avoid the worldly pursuits, the worldly interests, and seek knowledge from the celestial from the celestial beings who preside over the energetic <laughs> the energetic reality of all things. In other words, seek the highest spiritual uh, um, um, partnership that you can in all things, right? And so that may look, you know, to one of my teachers in that tradition who is, you know, he was not indigenous, but has been working with the tradition for 34 years. To him, the, the, the spirituality of Taoism very much fits into what the ayahuasca drinkers are, are saying and experiencing. And so I find personally, like Taoism is a great spiritual foundation for me. It helps me to understand that the world is the way that it is. It's not my job to fix the world. It's my job mm. to relate to the world in a way that brings me and others around me peace and inspiration. You know? um, um, so yeah, so those are some of the, some of the, have things. you heard of that book, the Tao, <laughs> the Tao of health, sex and longevity? By Daniel Reed. Uh, that's Daniel. Is Daniel that Reed, Daniel, I think. Daniel Reed. Yeah, I had that in my library for a long time, for many years. And I had to get rid Me of my too. library when I moved back from Costa Rica. But I need to get that again. I, I picked that one up probably 20-something years ago at the – at the. oh, yeah, one of my Qigong instructors from from the early 2000s. Uh, yeah, one of my Qigong instructors recommended that to me and I got a lot out of it at the time and read it for years, but yeah, I used to sleep with it under my pillow in my 20s. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there, there you was a know, whole, you know. Yeah, yeah, there's a whole Dallas section on developing the diamond body, which was very interesting. He talked about in that book about, you know, and it's interesting that even though, you know, we didn't talk specifically on recapitulation, the, you know, the last 15 or 20 minutes of what you've been talking about has been specifically a recapitulation, right? Going over your right, life, right. seeing what works, right. what doesn't work, you know, putting your emotional uh, body into context and seeing how you're developing what you're actually want to, you know, make real and how you're not, you know, through right. habits and rote and, 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 uh, you know, maybe misperceived information on how you can develop your life towards your personal goal. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what would you say, let's say, in relation to that on the, the specifics of energy work on healing, you know, their emotional body, you know, from past traumas and pains and, and things such as that? Well, I've done a lot of like physical healing work on myself. Um, the stuff that's been most impactful for me have been a couple different varieties of Qigong. Um, mm. one of, one of my studied for several years, which is very intense. It was very intense, very esoteric type of Qigong with that. That was very powerful and, and in doing what it advertised, which was like, uh, changing my energetic, energetic makeup. Uh, and so what I mean by that was that I felt differently about myself and I related differently to people. And so you can see that evidence of the process and work when you, when you do something like this in relationships that you've had, like all of a sudden, like the other person in that relationship isn't used to you being different and it can create either, you know what I mean? It can create uh, um, uh, difficulties in relationships when people change, but like, it's not like you're changing clothes or changing professions. Like something within you is, mm. is changing and, and it's not articulated or verbalized, but they sense it, they can feel it. Right. Uh, regarding energy work. Uh, there's so many modalities out there available. You know, I consider drinking yahe or ayahuasca. To me, that's energy work. It's a very energetic medicine. Very, very energetic. Like, um, I always learn a lot about who I am energetically, um, how I apply my ener energy and how I should apply my energy to life. And a lot of it has to do with how you're, the way that you think consumes energy. So a lot of times when we think of energy work, we think of energy work as like, oh, okay, well, it's 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 Reiki or it's acupuncture. We're trying to make sure that the the organs of the body are working together as that factory where all each organ is getting the right amount of energy that it needs to function. And that you know, it's 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 you know, this is this is acupuncture and this is Chinese medicine. It's like how do we how do we create the uh, greatest harmony energetically between all the systems and parts and organs of the body? So there's that. Lately, the way that I've been viewing energy work, or the way that I've come to just view this 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 concept of energy, is like, yeah, acupuncture has been very very helpful for me at times when I've been experiencing different sicknesses, digestive issues, um, energy, like, like low energy issues, even things like anxiety or depression, acupuncture has been very helpful. 
I've done Reiki. I've done Reiki on myself. And actually, like one time, I'm very certain that I saved my life by doing Reiki. I avoided having a, a very uh, invasive surgery. I was able to heal and punch through like whatever was blocking me uh, by using Reiki on myself. So there's that kind of energy work. I think the most valuable thing for people these days is to realize, hey, if you want energy work, go get energy work. Whatever yeah. it is, sacral, sacrocranial massages, if you want you mm. know, kundalini work, it's all available to you. And that's what's so cool. Like we live in a time where everything is available to you. And almost in no matter whatever community you're in, you can do breath work, which changes your energy. You can do stuff down at the YMCA. You can do stuff online and Zoom calls. You can get the energy work that you need physically. But I think it's really, really important for people to take note of the fact that energy is is – well, to answer the question of where does your energy go in your life? Like, where does mm. your energy go throughout the day? And, you know, most people think, oh, I was running the kids around, drop the kids are off. I had this deadline at work, whatever, whatever. But where is your energy going emotionally and intellectually, uh, mentally, right? Mm. And that's what I think is like where the most energy work needs to be done because, you know, we know scientifically that the brain consumes the most calories of all organs, right? It consumes mm. the most physical amount of energy, right? Interesting. And people are very, very, I mean... And I, I talk to people about this all the time, Lorenzo, like, you know, when I start to like interview someone, you know, for, for coaching or whatever, you know, like one of the things, like, what's going on in your mind? What is the, you know, what is the quality and content of your thoughts? Uh, and very, very often it's repetitive, negative thinking, repetitive, negative thinking. It takes a lot of energy. It okay? takes all of it. Um, <laughs> and that's, that's just the energy in your mind, right? Uh, that the, the expenditure of energy within your mind that's going to something negative, right? Something that's not moving your life forward and that's actually pulling it backwards. And the 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 other aspect of it is emotional energy. Where is the energy in your body? Like if you have anxiety, kaput, like you're done. You can't, you don't have the energy to perform anything. You know, I've been a martial artist for many years and the times that I've had anxiety and gone on the mat and, you know, tried to spar or roll jujitsu or whatever, like I feel like my physical strength is weakened. If I have anxiety, if I'm experiencing anxiety and I go down to the gym and it's leg day or, or push day or whatever it is, and I try to lift, I'll noticeably be unable to lift as much weights as I did a few days or a week prior when I was feeling emotionally free. What would you say anxiety is then that it weakens you so much? It's a, there's lots of different ways to answer that. I mean, you know, anxiety is, what is it they say, is worried about the future. Depression is worrying about the past. Anxiety is worried about the future. But I think what people actually feel as as anxiety is a, is a, is a physical disturbance, an actual agitation in the nervous system, an actual agitation in the nervous system. Okay. So the there is this thing we've heard of called the mind-body connection. These, these two things are intricately connected. And what's interesting, if you read, recently I was reading about this, so it was in... Uh, Joe Dispenza's book, I think it was How to Be Superhuman, but he talks about this connection between the mind. Sometimes the mind starts this, this system off. Sometimes the mind has a negative thought and it kicks it over to the emotional body and the emotional body reacts by flaring up the immune system. Or sometimes um, you may have a soda or you may be exposed to EMF or you may be, you, may be, uh, you, know, you didn't eat well or you had gluten's or whatever it was. You may be exposed to like an environmental toxin or something and then that agitates the nervous system but it puts the nervous system in a state where the mind says, okay, now that the nervous system in that state, I got to play my part and produce all of the negative content and start looping that in my mind. So there's this intricate connection that takes place. Mm. And so anxiety is really, it's, it's to me, it's, it's suspension in, in a lower level of consciousness where the nervous system is agitated and the mind is unable to access higher levels of thinking, higher quality thoughts, uh, higher consciousness, okay? If you can calm the mind, a lot of times the body will follow. If you can calm the body, a lot of times the mind will follow. But we want to be, well, what I'm interested in doing and what we all really want to be doing is we want to be able to say at any, mo any moment during the day, I'm amazing. I have a lot to do. I have some things to get done to move my life forward to provide for myself and for the ones I love most. I got to be at my best. So we have to be able to say, okay, I see what's happening right now. I feel that feeling within my body. Perhaps it starts in the solar plexus. Perhaps it's like a tingling or like a tension. Perhaps it's like a uh, almost a vibration. I feel that in my body. 
And now I recognize the result is the thoughts. I'm starting to think negatively. I'm starting to worry about dynamics in a relationship. I'm starting to worry about money. I'm starting to worry about this. And so the 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 real ability for people in this time as everything is advancing, the AI and everything is advancing, it's all moving so fast. And so we need, need to be able to catch up with it. And we need to be able to to really you could look at it in this way. We need to be able to 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 at will break the mind body connection between events and f- between feelings and the events that have shaped feelings right so you need to be able to say at any moment i need to have the, a level of self mastery over me to be able to say at any moment okay well i just had a fight with my wife and it's nine o'clock in the morning and now i gotta go to work i know myself well enough to know that this may set me back for a few hours all day, maybe three mm-hmm. days, maybe four days. This may take me offline for a week. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you've experienced this, right? Like something, something negative happens and it's like you go right in there and you're like, man, I thought I was going to let go of this. this. is the day. Two days have gone by. Mm-hmm. I'm still stewing on this. Yep. And so and so the, the, the real power, the real ability is to say, okay, I recognize what just happened. I mean, I've done this before many, many times, and now I'm in a process of retraining myself to develop the skill of letting go and breaking that connection between the the, the mind-body connection between the events and the feelings that were shaped by the events. And so I can say, okay, cool, that happened. I've practiced this. I have the ability, the power, <laughs> and the confidence, and I'm committed enough to let go of that feeling. And you may have to go into your mind and say, okay, where is it in my body? It's energy, just like, you know, Tesla, Einstein, everybody said energy is always in motion. It's going to move. It's going to dissipate if left alone. It's going to run its course. It's not stagnant. It's not static. It's not going to stay there. It moves. And you may have to actually like physically go in with your mind mentally and and mentally and physically and help the energy move. So for someone like me, who's a very physical person, I'm a very sensual, very physical, very, you know, just a, 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 a Taurus. I'm an earth sign, right? I'm a very grounded person. If I ever catch myself in this, which I, I do all the time, man, I'm like, I'm just, I'm just human all the time. Like, okay, I feel that anxiety coming back in. I always start with my body. So I go out and I'll do uh, a walk, walks, or walk the dogs, right? Walk, walk, walk. Uh, walk, walk, walks. Walk, walk, I go walk, to the walk. gym, lift heavy weights. Um, I go out and do Qigong or, you know, a, a Tai Chi form. Um, I'm going to do some Wim Hop breathing, go sit in the sauna and sweat it out, right? It always, for me, like really like what, what makes it possible for me to make these shifts really quickly is getting out of my head, grounded into my body, and then doing the work of like, okay, I understand how this process typically has worked in the past. It's very like me to allow this feeling that I just experienced, whether it's I looked on the news and everybody's screaming World War Three and we're all going to die, <laughs> you know, and like what that does to you, your nervous system, fight or flight, panic. I got no place to go. I'm in panic. Okay. It's my responsibility right now to... Wow breathe, release, and let go of that, disrupt that connection. So there's an, there's an event. And then there's the feeling about that. The event is the, whatever's happening out in the world. And then the feelings that are shaped by that event is what's happening in your own body, separate the two and learn how to master like your emotional, physical body so that you can step out of that. And what you'll find is that life is good. It's relaxed. Life is good. Life is good. It's relaxed. It's easy. You know, you can be productive when you're relaxed. You can be happy when you're relaxed. You can, you can surprise people, people who know you really, really well. And, and they're like, oh, he's pissed off now. They'll be like, oh boy, he's pissed off. He's going to be pissed off for a day. And then they'll they'll see you and you'll you'll go through this process in your mind right in front of them and be like, I'm pissed off. I realize that. Do mm-hmm. I want to be pissed off? I don't want to be pissed off. Let me move this out of my body. Let me move it out of my mind and heart. Let it go. Breathe, release, and let it go. And then be like, okay, cool. I'm over it, man. What do you want to do? You want to have fun? And then a lot of times it'll catch people. I mean, I've, I've done this so many times. It catches people. People go like, yo, you're bipolar. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Crazy. No, I'm not. I'm in control of myself. Mm. I'm in control of myself. And you're not used to seeing that with me. And you're not used to seeing that with other people. And so it's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of weird, right? Seeing somebody yeah. able to, he, seeing somebody you can say, I recognize I'm angry. I don't, I choose not to be angry. I'm going to be at peace and be happy right now. It's gold invaluable priceless. it is it's true I, I see myself doing that a lot i go ah, i almost got angry you know and then i did you know <laughs> i'm just about to get pissed off and you know but i think by bringing it out you you made a good point there like if you if you're with somebody you go you know that almost made me angry but instead i'm gonna laugh right and so you kind of bring out the emotions from the darkness you bring it into yeah. the light and uh, you know i found the same thing that you've mentioned if i'm not Ooh. kind or loving my limit my options seem to become limited almost immediately yeah or even you know, or even just um, 
you know, or even just being like, you know, hey, it's okay to be angry. I'm mm -hmm. angry. Uh, like, you know, I actually find these days when I do get angry, I, I, I relish it. I enjoy it. It feels good. It's a higher energy than what a lot of people are experiencing. You know, when you're in grief, apathy, uh, depression, anxiety, fear, overwhelm, self-doubt, worry, um, mm -hmm. you know, when you're in those states of emotion, anger is, there's more energy in anger than there are in those other emotions. There's more energy. So energy is what, you know, you asked about energy earlier, like, it's a very low energy to be stuck in fight or flight mode, fear mode all, all the time. It's a very low level of energy. The kinds of thoughts you experience is the field of consciousness that you have access to is very low grade, very just mm. base, right? <laughs> you know, it's base desires, it's base fears, it's all of that kind of stuff. And so really the goal of all of this, of my life, uh, you know, is to to be able to master my own, the, the way that I show up energetically to my life and in this world for the people who I care about and you know, the people who depend on me. And so, you know, anger is, anger can be very, very helpful. But what we're talking about here is the ability to say, okay, I feel anger. I'm not judging anger, but is that what I want to feel? Mm. Fuck it. I'll feel some anger. Let's go beat the punching bag up. Let's go spar, right? Anger's good. I don't want to feel anger. I don't want to be angry today. I don't want to have this vibe about me. Okay, well then I choose not to be angry. There's I think a, a lot, lot of power in that. And it's true. I think a lot of people miss when I when you say loving or kindness, you also have to turn that back on yourself. Sometimes feeling angry is a, a loving kindness to yourself if somebody's invading your space or doing something that's Absolutely. not. Absolutely. You know, I, I think a lot of people have been told from the new age they've been ruined. Sit back, it's kind, only love and light, accept, and this is how the world and you've shared lots of that information over the years yeah. too. Uh the monsters that be, let's call them take over by telling people they shouldn't be angry. They shouldn't be looking after their family. They shouldn't mm -hmm. be protective of what's theirs and, you know, and, and what they need to do. A lot of times, as you've said, that's loving yourself. Yeah. You know, and, and yeah, sure. We're all dealing with what's going on in the world, Lorenzo. We're all concerned, you know, all those high minded people are all concerned, but like they're, every one of us has our own little life. Yeah, you know, everyone has their own life, our own set of responsibilities. We all have our own relationships. We all have mm. our own relationships, and you know, so you know, uh, I'll say this: a lot of the the clients that I've had, and I, I tend to find a lot of, uh, I tend to attract a lot of like women, older women clients, a lot of single older women clients. You know, mm. just just mm. wanting to walk with someone for a little bit, it just changes their perspective on things. And uh, you know, it's it's not uncommon for people in this demographic to to. Um, have lost a lot of time in their lives um, by people pleasing, um, over obligating themselves, doing more for others than they would do for themselves. And so these relationships developed over years and years and years, whether it's a marriage, whether it's a you know relationship with your grown up kids who are you know taking advantage of you or or you know I've seen you know relationship with parents, older parents, relationship with siblings, you know like, mm. Um, you know, relationships tend to uh, find their their rut, their groove, and just kind of move along in that same groove for a long time. And people people of high conscience and high mind don't realize that that a lot of times, like the the freedom that they're seeking in the the world at large, the freedom that they're seeking by by taking on this information, by by making an effort to learn what's really happening in the world, the freedom that they're seeking was never to be found out there. Anyways, they were never meant to fix the world in a way that gave them that sense of freedom that mm -hmm. they're looking for. You know, I can, you know, free from government intervention, whatever. Like it was never meant that what you're meant to find is freedom in your own life. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of people like this, who are in these relationships, they don't even realize it, that they've, they've uh, subjugated themselves to relationships. And so uh, whenever I see this happening, I, I, I try to find ways to make people angry. <laughs> Right, because what I've noticed is is people in these these ongoing, um, you know, whether they're fully abusive or just narcissistic or codependent relationships or whatever they may be, right? They don't recognize that they have the right to be angry. That it's safe for them to be angry. To them, it feels like a risk. The whole world's going to mm -hmm. come crashing down. You know, it's I'll be abandoned or run off or they'll overpower me or whatever if I if I dare get angry. And so the their their life, their selves within themselves just keeps shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Mm -hmm. They just feel smaller and smaller and smaller. But if they can get get to anger, then with that anger, that energy, they can they can muster what's uh, an even higher energy that which is courage and courage really courage and truth are really you know they're really the the they're really um, peas in the same pod they're really you know partners 
um, they're really right there, the same energy. So when they finally get angry, then they can be courageous. And with courage, because with, with courage comes the ability to tell the truth to yourself and tell the truth to mm. others. And that's what changes things is truth. Truth changes things. So for all the truth warriors out there and info warriors mm. and everything out there, like, yeah, truth, truth is the vibration that we need, but master the truth within yourself first i know so many people who are yeah. engaging in politics who are engaging in social change and i just like when you there's so much left to be desired in their own lives in their own little universe and i could just so many people that i've talked to is like you would be so much more powerful so much more effective mm -hmm. in, in your pursuits to participate in these other arenas if you're operating with power in your own life first if you weren't trying to force these outcomes onto the world if you're operating from a place of power and it's Honestly, it's it's kind of rare that I meet somebody who's out there, you know, uh, engaging in change making who really is um, doing it from a position of personal power versus a position of force. You know, I would agree a thousand percent. I mean, in some ways, we've walked a similar path in what you've done in Waking Times and what we did with our print, <laughs> the New Agora, and it really came down to that. I found too many people wanting to change the outside world, but as soon as you mentioned. A little bit of dirt on their inside world they'd lose their mind and run away uh yeah and you know and what, what shocks me to be quite honestly is you know like i have a long a lifelong history of you know alcoholism and drug abuse right mm. and what really really uh you know what's what really surprises me is how many people of higher consciousness and i i've, I've even done this in the past i don't i don't drink anymore i sometimes participate in cannabis other than that i stay sober and it's amazing to me how many people who haven't tried chemical sobriety for any for any long period of time are trying to pursue and achieve high consciousness because they don't understand because they're inside that energy they don't understand like the, how much the energy of especially drinking alcohol cool. um uh, brings brings you down it's it's quite profound and so when i find people really trying to strive for a better life and they're drinking alcohol in any capacity i just like like it's a great place to start yeah. it is you know, most people have missed, you know, you make your own reality. And so you really have to understand the engine of your creation, which is you, you know, as you move out. And if you don't understand your own engine, you know, how can you get anywhere? That would be, <laughs> you know, what I say about the alcohol things like that, if you're filling yourself with alcohol, you know, obviously you have a certain sort of creative level or a certain sort of creative power that would be different if you did find your sobriety and the independence of your own personal power, let's say. Yeah, and it's not easy. I mean, from someone who has no. that as part of my story, it's it's really, really not easy. I mean, several of the clients I've been working in with this year are working on sobriety, chemical mm. sobriety from drugs. And it's an interesting, it's an interesting walk to take to someone, uh, to take with someone who is like, okay, I, f I finally recognize that I uh, that the pleasure isn't worth the pain. Mm. How do I break the cycle? How do I get through today? How do I get through tomorrow? How do I get to a place of peace? And it's it can be quite a journey for some to get that stuff out of your life. But the rewards are are, are unbelievable because um, uh, what happens, especially people who have reached their you know late thirties, forties, fifties, and are still engaging in self medication through drugs, food, um, you know, sex, whatever it is, like they're still engaging in these things. They they really haven't ever had a clear picture of the emotional drivers that have really been mm. working underneath the surface mm. to create the circumstances and situations and opportunities that they've had and taken advantage of in their life. And so um, I think that one of the things I take the greatest joy in these days after spending so many times, so many, so many years publishing Awakening Times is, is helping people to see that, helping people to understand what's happening uh, below the surface uh, with their uh, emotional realm, you know, what level of consciousness they live in, how they approach consciousness, um, and just how clear of a picture do they have on their own feelings, right? Mm. Everybody knows that you can go out and, you know, get hammered, right? And you're going to go through like a crazy range of emotions. Mm. And at the time that all of it's happening, like you're absolutely have no idea what's going on, but you can see the entire gamut screaming, mm. fighting, crying, loving, whatever. Like you can see the whole gamut and they're not feeling any of those at the time that they're happening. 
right? And so when you when you pull alcohol substances, anything else out of like anything out of the way and out of the picture, they start to feel like this very uncomfortable feeling. Like, oh, something's something's bothering me. Uh, it's five o'clock. Where's that the glass of wine? You know, mm-hmm. like something something's off. Something's not right. Mm. And if they are committed enough to themselves in this process, like they're committed enough to to achieving sobriety and emotional sobriety, they'll they'll get to experience that over time. The anxiety that they've been living with, they start to identify it really, and it starts to fall away. Like they start to become used to living. They they, they become used to uh, seeing their emotional reality for what it is, not reality. It's not who they are. It's not what they are. And they start to live alongside of that and develop a, a sort of different path for themselves. And that's like, for me, that's so cool to see, like to work with people and to see them finally start to understand like, oh, okay, for years I've been returning to the same set of negative feelings because I always felt this way. Where did that feeling come from? Oh, back when I was little, I used to feel this way all the time. Yeah, okay, okay, cool. Well, in order to get to that feeling and access it and change that feeling, we have to clear everything else out of the way. So can we stop drinking? Can we take a break from caffeine? Can we, you know, like what else can we get out of the way? Can we stop sedating yourself with TV? Can we... Uh, control your sugar intake. Can we control anything that's that's affecting and impacting and changing your emotional state, so that you can get the the greatest amount of clarity on what's actually going on inside of you? So valuable, incredibly yes. valuable. It's interesting. I've been addicted to all the things you've mentioned. You know, TV, sugar, <laughs> alcohol, cannabis, uh, anger, sex, whatever. And and I found <laughs> in my own life, yeah, I've had to stop all of those, or at least you know, reduce them to near zero to allow my energy to grow to a place where I can make more intelligent choices for myself. Exactly. And, and, you know, for me, if we're going to tie this back into Ikigai, if people aren't familiar with what their purpose in life is, maybe their purpose is to find their purpose. And, you know, that would be a good place to start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's, well, let's see. The, 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 it's so funny because there's, you know, there's so many uh, high-minded quotes about, you know, what your purpose is and, yeah. You know, mm. You can read one one day and it's perfect, and then read one the next day and you're like, "Oh, no, this was perfect." You know, mm. was, you know, like someone I saw someone was like, "What if your purpose is simply just to like learn more about yourself and evolve mm. more as much as you can?" <laughs> like, yeah, that's the what best. If that's purpose. it. Like, <laughs> just the pay is to like figure out how to pay more and more attention and do what you think is better for you as much as possible. You know, um, but you know, people, what people really want or what they think they want, they think they want. Um, they think they want to. Uh, they think they want to be a healer, right? And they mm. think they want to make. They think they want to be some a healer where they can make enough money to support themselves on to give themselves that like freedom that you know is like that's the carrot on the stick that we're all you know like aiming for in this in this economy that we're in this uh, mm. highly manipulated economy, right? Mm. So what they think is they want is they think they'll be happy like once they get like you know that set up and have that freedom of that healer's life or whatever, mm. and and you know what they really want. So they really want to to feel a sense of peace within themselves. And so that may come through doing healing work. Um, it may come from doing hands-on healing for someone else and realizing that by healing someone else, you're actually making a really like positive impact on yourself. And in fact, in one of my newsletters I just wrote, I think it might have even been the one I published this morning, but you know, just this idea that like like when I coach people, like when I work with people, you know, like it's always the process i see it like as clear as day like i'm always evolving and changing and up leveling mm. as i go with them you know and so um i don't know i i personally think that people really feel happy they, hap- they really feel much happier if they're even just feeling on a day-to-day basis like they're moving closer towards their ideal self like mm. that alone that alone feels purposeful like you know I, Today, I've made steps forward towards my ideal self versus dragging myself backwards, you know? Maybe it's a matter of you get what you give. You know, again, I, I see a mirror when I'm talking with you and that, you know, you've been giving intelli- <laughs> you've been giving intelligent information for so long, you know, whether it's waking times or now it's directly with coaching, and then it's coming back at you, right? You're kind of getting what you've been sharing. And, yeah. uh, you know, and we came to a similar purpose in life, let's say, at a similar time, as have a lot of people, that's not enough. You know, just to put words out there and just to put, or put other people's words out there, you know, you got to get off your, your behind and then go make a positive, 
uh, difference, whether it's one on one or with your family or with your friends or with your children and with your pets. And, you know, then you're getting it back and becoming a better person, as you say. And, you know, you know, you seem to be at peace with yourself. I can see in this this chat we're having. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it's been I can honestly say that I've, I've experiencing some of the greatest levels of peace I've ever experienced in my life at this stage. I'm 47 years old. Um, but it's very, very easy for me. It's very, very easy for everybody to be knocked off that center, mm. to be knocked off that center and not feel that peace. And, you know, like the, the yardstick that we're going for is, well, how quickly can you pick yourself back up? You know, like there's, there's things that happen to me on a weekly basis in my own house that, mm. you know, in the past would have triggered mm. and occupied my mind for half a day a day two days three days four days mm. and now i you know like the, the peace comes from the the ability the capacity the skill of being able to say okay i'm not going to spend my time like that here's what i know my body and my physiology needs to address this and to move forward and here's what i know my mind needs to move forward it's a process it's a skill it's a mechanism let me engage that mechanism and move on and that's where peace just like sobriety like it's one day at a time like if you you want to quit drinking alcohol and you stop drinking alcohol you made it sober for a day that's one day at a time you had a sober day amazing amazing if you do that two days and yeah if you do that two days in a row you've had two sober days eventually you have a week eventually you can have a month eventually you can have a year or multiple years or whatever it is and it's the same thing that we're talking about you know so i, I look at it in terms of emotional sobriety was I free of negativity within myself today? I have been almost completely free of negativity within myself today. That doesn't mean that I was the same way yesterday. It doesn't mean that it was easy the day before that. But it means that today, I have not relapsed into a set of negative emotions. And I think using the language of addictions around addiction around this is very helpful because it is a relapse, right? Because like... Even people that I know that I know and I've coached with uh, that are in like very very dire straits with their lives, you know, uh, very very dire straits, just can't seem to see through the fog of it all, no matter what. And then all of a sudden, one day they get a tiny little glimpse, and that that tiny little glimpse, you're like, hey, well, you know that it's possible there, all right? So mm -hmm. There's a possibility of feeling better there, right? So. There's no rule that says that you can't experience more of that. Or there's no rule that says you can't experience only that if you want to. But now that you've done enough work to recognize that there is possibility, mm. then let's practice. All right. Can you feel that way right now? Can you live in that energy for five minutes? Can you live in that energy for an hour? You know, um, how long can you live in that energy before relapsing back into anxiety, fear, overwhelm, and doubt? If it's only five minutes, great. Maybe next time it'll be six, right? But you stack days just like sobriety, just like a program like Alcoholics Anonymous or anything. You stack, you stack moments, you stack days, you stack years, right? Like I've been um, the last drink of alcohol I've had, Lorenzo. I think it's five hundred and twenty-three days or, or something like that. Stacked days, right? The last time I even I even had a sip of alcohol, right? Five hundred and something days. It's not even a year and a half, mm -hmm. right? But it's five hundred freaking days, man. To somebody who is identified as being an alcoholic at times past in their life, like that's unreal to think about if mm. I have a drink in my hand. Mm. This is 500 days without this delicious nonsense here, like impossible, right? But I don't relapse anymore into alcoholism. I just don't. The pleasure for me isn't worth the pain. And so uh, below that, are the emotional conditions and programs that drove me to drink in the first place or drove me to drink destructively in the first place. And so now I'm working on that same level of emotional sobriety. You know, I have right now, however many days or hours since the last time I felt negativity, neg negativity within my being. Right. And that's what I'm aiming for is to no longer feel negativity or to, or to be able to turn it around on a dime, recenter myself, get back to my center whenever I feel any negativity, whether that's I open up and, you know, see a scary news story about the latest COVID hoax or, you know, more mandates come, whatever it is, like whatever it is, it scares me. Like I'm just not, I'm not available to go on that emotional uh, roller coaster. Yeah. Yeah. I think people haven't realized, or a lot of people haven't, I know I didn't, that being sober, finding your life's purpose moving forward is a constant effort, nonstop the time you open your eyes, even when you're dreaming, you know, even now when I'm asleep and I'm doing my dreaming practices, 
I'm yeah. finding I'm, I've always got to be aware of where my emotional body or the, the rest of me is trying to take me. But I want to make sure I'm the one in control and taking myself to where I'm choosing to go. Awesome. Yep. Yeah. I totally agree with that. Yep. All right. Constant effort, constant commitment. I would agree. Definitely. Definitely. Well, Dylan, perhaps we've come to, uh, you know, a, a lovely conclusion on this chat on Ikigai awesome. life's purpose, uh, you know, emotional sobriety. I, I, I like the fact that that's been the underlying topic in this. Cause I would fully agree that if you're not emotionally sober, you know, you generally get lost in your emotional body. So it makes it very hard to make good choices for yourself. And uh, absolutely. Yeah. is there anything you'd like to leave our lovely viewers with on the way out? Uh, just, yeah, just uh, awesome. It's really an honor to be here and speak to anybody. I sometimes get an opportunity to speak on podcasts or whatever, and I talk to people all over the world, and it's a tremendous honor. I meet so many, so many great, interesting people. Um, if you'd like to find out what my coaching is about, um, you can go to my website, dylancharlescoaching.com. You can sign up you for a free 15 minute, uh, just insight call. We can chat. We'll just get on the phone and chat for 15 minutes and share insight. I love doing that. And if you at that point, if you're interested in coaching, great. If not, no big deal. I just talk to people all the time. Um, I will say that my website, waking times and my podcast battered, uh, battered souls, like those have kind of been on pause for about a year now. I haven't published much content. Um, I feel like I might be moving back in the direction of publishing and producing podcasts again this year. Um, but I'm really just kind of letting uh, uh, just some other really important things in my life take take root, uh, firm up. Um, but yeah, please, um, if you go to dylancharlescoaching.com, you can get a free 15-minute insight call or you can sign up for my newsletter. And I just like share insights and interesting stuff on the newsletter. So uh, thank you so much for having me on. It's always a joy to talk to people scattered all around this big blue earth. All around, so. yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm signed up to uh, your newsletter and I love getting it. And I will leave these links below. Obviously, if anybody wants to talk with uh, Dylan, I think you'd be lucky to have those 15 <laughs> minutes with a man like him that can give you some honest interpretations of what could help you to become free because there's nothing better or nothing more worth uh, the challenge in this life than understanding yourself and seeing where, I mean, you've got one life, death is coming for all of us. Might as well make the most of it. <laughs> Hallelujah, my man. Thank you so Hallelujah. much, Lorenzo. I appreciate, appreciate you having me on the show. I appreciate you being here. Cheers, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I love you all very much. Hope to have Dylan back another time. I will leave all the links below. Questions, suggestions, all intelligent responses are welcome. <laughs> Light of my heart, no one tells me where I should start. Freedom first is what I say.